Welcome everybody, and we welcome all of you on Facebook Live. I think it's opposite of that. There you go. Let's all stand together. We are grateful to be together today to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen.
praise a hallelujah in the presence of
hallelujah to you, Lord. The highest praise to you, Jesus. Amen.
thoughts and struggles, battles that we've had this week, all the uh, distractions, anything that right now is trying to distract our mind from really connecting with you. Lord, we just pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will just settle upon this place. Fill us, Lord, with your love, your grace, your power, the freshness of your Holy Spirit's power. Lord, just tune our hearts to hear your voice today, we pray. We just give you praise for that. Lord, we ask you to work among us, work healing, strength, restoration, anything that's uh, uh, healing uh, wise right now, anything that's uh, struggling, we just pray that you would strengthen it right now. Anything that's weak and broken, Lord, just revitalize it in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We all need that, Father. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, let's take a minute and greet one another. And we are dismissing the elementary, but the youth stay in here for full service today. <laughs> Hello. Shut my mic. It's wonderful to have events like that because we just, you know, it's just have, we've missed it for a whole year for one thing, and uh, we're going to be doing more, more events and more things to bring us together, just have fun fellowship. We don't, I want to give you a special welcome this morning if you're a first-time guest here at Summit Springs today, and we have a gift for you as you depart today. If you just stop by our Welcome Center in the foyer and leave your information, then um, we would love to have a record of your visit here. And just a few announcements. We have uh, our men's studies that are continuing on Monday night at 6.30. <laughs> Emphasize on the 6. And uh, our uh, Tuesday, Thursday morning revelation class is going on with just a great group of guys. And it's so wonderful to see our men um, want to be in the Word of God, want to study, and want to know how God's word applies to what is going on in our world today. And we are definitely seeing uh, revelation and everything leading up to the culmination of this age. We don't know how long that's going to be, but we know the signs are definitely there. So we're, we're going to be ready, right? That's what the Bible says. Jesus told us that 2,000 years ago. Just be ready, okay? That's serious stuff, you know. So... That's awesome, and our women's uh, praise and prayer is Tuesday at 1 here in the sanctuary. We just look forward to having that time to intercede and pray over all the needs that are represented around us, and our, um, our preschool department has been fully staffed now. We're so thankful for that. We just have still openings in the nursery, and um, you look at, you know, those are not real faces up there, but aren't they cute? <laughs> you just think, you know, when you look at your kids when they're that age and they were in their bed sleeping you know this okay this is why I became a parent you know so I can love those moments they're not like that all the time but neither are we you know I watch my grandkids get in trouble and I think well what about you mom and dad you know what about you? <laughs> do you need me to step in here <laughs> no they don't need me to do that 
And guys, uh, next Sunday, Mother's Day, just a little heads up for you. <laughs> you're, we know you're not married to your mother, but um, all the, the women in your life that do such an awesome job to make life uh, livable, we certainly appreciate our moms. We have a, guest, a gift for all the moms next Sunday here. So bring your moms, and we just want to love on them, and we love you, everyone. Bless you. I made, a, I made a mistake when we were newlyweds of telling her she wasn't my mother and I wasn't going to, I wasn't, no. I, we weren't newlyweds. So I was, I mean, why should I get a card? I had to get my mother a card. So, uh, well, I know I look bad all the time anyway, so it's a part of life. But anyway, you know, you learn things. And I'm wondering in the nursery if, if it would help if we brought a, uh, a lab or a golden retriever into the nursery and just, you know, as an assistant nursery worker, would that help calm things down in there? <laughs> Sounds good to me. If I was a little toddler, I'd love to have a nice lab or golden retriever in there to lay on. All right. Well, good to see everyone. And I want to personally thank uh, Mike Collier for filling in for me last week. Give him a hand. He did a good job. It's good to have uh, elders and folks that can uh, fill, fill in and share the Word of God when uh, I'm out of town or need a break. And uh, so uh, praise God for that. Well, it's good to see all of you. And, and I just want to report to you men particularly that the wives did behave themselves pretty well yesterday. We, we had a, a few little instances, but nothing serious. <laughs> we had a security team on site just in case, in case the women got out of hand. But uh, they didn't. They, uh, they did pretty good. So uh, I told Marnie, you know, we had a special person watching her. She's probably watching online because she's, the, she's probably the one that needs the most supervision. We love you, Marnie. <laughs> well, let's pray. We're going to get into the Word this morning. We're going to be in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, if you want to turn there in your Bible or your electronic device. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your presence with us. We thank you for your faithfulness in shepherding our lives and leading us through every season, through every uh, time of life, Lord, and we give you praise for that. Now, we thank you for your word, because we're going we're gonna to study your word to get together today and, and draw from it and feed from it. We thank you for that. Just bless it, nourish our, our spiritual beings with your word today, in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about, uh, uh, in the Discerning the Times series, I talked about what Paul said. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, uh, basically, he said, be careful because in the latter days, uh, there's going to be opportunity for people to fall away because of uh, false doctrine, demonic. And he actually called it demonic doctrine. Now, that's a pretty, pretty strong uh, statement if you think about it. But uh, we, have to, we have to realize it is what it is and call it what it is. Uh, you know, there's one thing to be in a society where tolerance and everything is the norm, and as Christians, we're supposed to tolerate all kinds of philosophies and doctrines. But, but I'm telling you right now, in the, in the church and in the realm of biblical Christianity, there are boundaries, and we need to be careful and make sure that we're within those boundaries. And if you're a born-again believer and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and uh, you're one who uh, studies the Word. You know, I, I, I'm sure that you can tell, you, you sense when you're being exposed to a, a false doctrine. So, that, but that's important that we stay alert in those things. And that's why, that's why Paul says, he says, but the Spirit explicitly says. I, I, you don't find that word explicitly very often in the scriptural writing. But uh, Paul's really trying to make a point here. He says the, the Spirit is very focused on warning us that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, faith paying attention to 
deceitful spirits. That's where that, this doctrine comes from. And teaching, literally teaching of demons. So, so in light of that, just kind of a review from two weeks ago, uh, let's go into John chapter 17. Most of you, if you studied the Gospels, you know that John 17 is a very important chapter in John's Gospel because it's considered to be Jesus's final high priestly prayer over his disciples and over the future church, over us, really. And uh, he prays for us in several different ways, but I, I want to focus particularly on what he prays in verses 13 to 21. Now, if you know, Jesus starts out chapter 17 with basically praying to the Father, saying, Lord, I'm, Father, I'm coming to you, uh, and he, he was about to die. Uh, you know, in, in John 17, the very next chapter, he's arrested and uh, crucified in 19 and so on. So he's at the end of his earthly ministry, and he's about to leave his disciples. He feels like he's prepared his disciples for this the best he possibly could. And now he's saying, Father, I'm leaving, I'm coming to you, but my disciples are going to be here in the world. So he prays. Uh, several things. But in verse 13, he says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Talking about his disciples. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, I sometimes wish he had. Have you, ever, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, wow, Lord, I wish we could just go to heaven now and, and get out of uh, all of the conflict and the spiritual warfare and the things that are going on? But he says, he says no. He says, uh, you know, I don't want to take them out of the world because uh, he, he says I, I, it's important that they stay in the world, basically. But keep them in the world. Keep them from the evil one. So he's praying specifically that even though we're in the world, we have to deal with the world system. We have to deal with all of the demonic influences around us. Jesus has already prayed for us. Now that's good. Now I can pray for you and it should have some benefit. But if Jesus prays for you, I mean, is there any level of prayer that you could find anywhere in the universe that is higher, more powerful, more effective than that? Jesus has prayed for us. He's prayed for his body on this earth that we would be uh, able to discern the evil one's messages and not fall prey to them. So he says, uh, but keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then he says in verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. In other words, his original 12 disciples, he's praying for more. But for those also who believe in me through their word. So that's us. You know, we have all in one way or another come to Christ by the hearing of the gospel. And the gospel was recorded and preached by the apostles. And so we are the ones he's talking about there when he talks about all those down through the generations of mankind who have come to Christ because of the preaching of the gospel and the reading of scripture. Uh, we're the recipients of that. And so he says here, uh, he says he sanctified himself and he wants us to sanctify ourselves in the truth so that as we stay in the world, he says, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So this is awesome. I mean, you know, a lot of times we read over things like that, and we may not catch the full impact of what Jesus is saying there. Let me point out a few things in that passage, and then we're going to look at another passage that John the Apostle wrote as well that's similar. In uh, 
just you see it in, in this whole 13 through 21. First of all, he tells us that he has given us his father's word. That's, that's the basis of what he's talking about. There's a strong emphasis in this passage of scripture on the concept of truth. And that's what he's talking about. The word of God is the source of our truth. It's the only, the only sure source of truth. And that's why everything that we do, everything that we believe, everything that we process in this world in trying to make decisions and trying to make life choices needs to be undergirded by the principles of his word. Now, I've always said there's a lot of things in, in the modern world that the scripture doesn't speak to directly and uh, in detail. You know, like, for example, the car, you know, the scripture, I always say the scripture doesn't tell me what kind of car to buy. You know, scripture doesn't even talk about those kind of things, but yet it gives us principles of knowing how to be good stewards over the resources that God gives us, knowing how to have limits in our life and not run ourselves into debt and get ourselves into situations where we're serving mammon rather than serving God. So, but the, but the word of God is so foundational in every area of our life. There's not a single area of our life that doesn't have an undergirding foundation in the Word of God if we'll just understand what the Scripture's teaching is. So Jesus says I, they're in the world, they're going to have a lot of struggles, and they're going to have a lot of conflict, and they're going to have a lot of battles, but I've given them your Word. And so that's why Jesus feels confident in leaving and going back to the Father because we know have access to the Word of God. And he says here, because of that, he says, the world hates them. Look at this. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. I see something in that verse right there that's important. What is it that separates you and I from the world? It's not just that we claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's broader than that. It's the fact that we live by a different law. We live by the Word of God. And it's the Word of God, which is the truth of the universe in us that causes us to be different from the world. And so even though we're in the world, we live by the truth of God's Word, and it automatically causes us to be seen by the world as being unique. <laughs> that word unique may not be positive. And so, depending on the group that you're around. And so, because of this, it says the world hates us. They hated Jesus because he taught the truth. Jesus could have come and just parroted what the Pharisees were teaching, just been another Pharisee, and he'd have fit right in. But he didn't. He came preaching the true, unadulterated, uncompromised Word of God. And it caused him to stand out in the midst of his generation, in the midst of his religious system, and they hated him for it, and they ended up uh, killing him for it. And so we see this here, that, that it, there's something very unique that Jesus is saying in this prayer. So we are hated, really, because Jesus has given us the Word of God, which has caused us not to be of the world anymore. And so that's a defining difference in our lives. And then he talks about this word sanctification, which is a word that most Christians don't particularly like, and uh, partly because they don't understand what it means. The word sanctification means to be set apart for God's purpose. When you're talking about sanctifying something, it, it's, not, it's not always what you think. It's not this idea of, of I am totally uh, untouchable and out of touch with reality and out of touch with the world. No, it just it means that you are you are now taken out of the world and put into a place for God's own purpose. Just like in the Old Testament, there were certain vessels in the temple, certain uh, articles in the temple, particularly all of the temple, uh, that was sanctified for a specific purpose. They didn't have town hall meetings in the temple, okay? 
They didn't have fundraisers. Well, they did later. <laughs> That's what one of the things that Jesus rebuked them for. But they didn't have, you know, they didn't have uh, carnivals in the temple. They didn't have all the things that society has. Things that aren't necessarily bad, but they, they just weren't in the temple because the temple was set apart for God's purpose. Uh, they didn't have church dinners in the temple. And so all of those things that, that you see uh, in the Old Testament that talk about sanctification, those vessels, those, those cups and bowls and everything were set apart for one use and one use only. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying here that I, in verse 17, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth, as you sent me, I've sent them, for I sanctified myself. In other words, he showed us how to walk in truth that sets him apart for God's purpose. And he says, we also can be sanctified in the truth and be set, set apart for God's purpose as well. Notice it's the truth that is the sanctifying agent here. He says in verse 17, sanctify them in your truth. That's why it's so important that Christians know the word and learn to apply the word and learn to walk in the word. Because if we don't, then we're just like the world. See, if I, if I, if I say, if I go out into the community or any place I'm going and I, and I talk about Jesus and I talk about uh, being in relationship with Jesus Christ, to talk about being a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, but yet there's nothing different about me in my belief system and in my life choices and in my actions. If I adopt the same things that the world adopts, if I believe the same thing the world believes, but yet I claim to be a Christian and go to church on Sunday, th then what good is that? The world doesn't recognize me as being any different than what they are. And so Jesus says, I am set apart in your word because your word is truth. It says it right there in verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And he says, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. <clears throat> into the world. I sanctify myself. Jesus basically means here, I've stayed in the truth. And he's telling us that we have the opportunity to stay in the truth also. So we are set apart then by the word of God. And Jesus wants us to follow his example and to continue to hold fast to his truth. And then he says in the, in the last part of that verse, that passage, he said, all believers are really unified in Christ through a common truth. Because it's because of the common truth that we have in Jesus Christ, found in the Word, that we have unity, that we have any conformity whatsoever. I can go all over the world and I can find Christians that are true born-again lovers of the Word, that have, that, that have accepted the truth of God's Word, and I immediately have a bond with them. I mean, it's amazing. And, and I know you've noticed this too. You, you find people on your job, you find people out in the community that you realize the Spirit bears witness your spirit with their spirit, or in conversation, you realize that you guys are, gals are on the same page with somebody, and you talk to them, and you find out it's because they're not only followers of Jesus outwardly, but they live and understand and value the truth of God's Word. So that's what Jesus is praying for us here. Now turn to Second John, the little epistle of Second John, back in the back of your New Testament, just before the book of Revelation. And it's interesting because, and this is the same author. John wrote the first, second, and third John later than he wrote the Gospel of John. And the thing I like about John is, and I like all, I like all the Bible writers, don't get me wrong, but John was the only one who lived a full life and had the opportunity to live about 30 years beyond Peter and Paul and James and really all the other disciples. They were all martyred approximately in the, in the 60s A.D. John lived clear to almost 100 A.D. And so John had about another 30, 35 years to see the development of the early Christian church and to actually have input and work with the churches in his region. And 
and I'm not saying it gives him more value in his writings, but it gives him a perspective about some of these things we're talking about that is a little bit longer term, even than what Paul and Peter had. And so he's writing in 2 John here, and he uses some interesting terms. And commentators believe that it could very well have been because of the persecution that was getting so intense towards the end of the first century that he didn't name names and he didn't talk particularly even about the church in the term church. Notice what he says, to the elder, to the elder to the chosen lady and her children. Most commentators believe he's talking to a local church because the lady, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. And very well, he could have been talking to a church. It could have been a house church. Uh, but, but nevertheless, he's not most likely not talking to a female. He's talking to a church. So he's saying they're the chosen lady and her children. Her children would be the people that make up the congregation and who have been brought into Christ under the leadership of that church. He says, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Verse 2, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, peace, be with us from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad, verse 4, to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do so from the Father. So, in that one intro passage there, verses 1 through 4, he uses the word truth four times. Would you say that the theme of this letter, it's a short letter, it's only, it's only about 13 verses long. Would you say the theme of this letter is truth and the importance of truth, power of truth? And so he talks about it here in, in a very direct way, but it's somewhat veiled because I, I believe it's probably because of the circumstances around him. And he goes on and says in verse 5, he says, Now I ask you, lady, once again the church, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but one which you have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you, had, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, verse 8, that you do not lose what you've accomplished. It's amazing how, how John's writing this. He says, be careful that you watch, watch yourself that you do not lose what we've accomplished. What have we accomplished? Well, we've accomplished salvation in Jesus Christ. We've accomplished relationship with Jesus Christ. We've accomplished an understanding to whatever point they were in their spiritual growth of what the truth is and what the truth is teaching. So he says, be careful, because there's a lot of deceptive doctrines and philosophies out there. Be careful that you don't lose what you've accomplished. He says here, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, talking about the teaching the apostles taught, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now, let's go back here and look at a couple things in this here. Uh, this, is an interesting, this is an interesting epistle. Would you agree? I mean, he's writing some <clears throat> very personal things. Uh, he's writing in a way that, uh, I, you know, to me, it's very simple to understand what he's saying. Let's break, the, break this down a little bit. First of all, he says that... Uh, he says, I love the church in truth. He says, the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. 
I, I personally, and most of you know this about me, <clears throat> I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a real touchy-feely guy, and I don't talk a lot about love because, you know, but I talk a lot about truth. To me, love without truth is not true love. Does that, let that sink in a minute. So for me as a pastor, I have to start with the truth. That's the most loving thing I can do. If I water down the truth, or if I compromise the truth, or if I short sell the truth, and I don't teach really what the Bible says, and I just, you know, am nice, whatever you want me to be, whatever people want a pastor to be, if, if I do that and fall short of sharing the truth with you, then I haven't loved you. I may have made you feel good, but I haven't loved you. And that's the thing that, that's the, I see this as, as one of the core messages that John is bringing out right here in this, this epistle. He says, I've loved you in truth, and I love all those who know the truth. And then he says, for the sake of truth, uh, which abides in us, and will be forever. So, what's he telling us there? Love is based, true love is based on truth. It's an eternal truth. It's going to be with us forever. It's not going to change at the end of this age. In the eternal kingdom, in the millennium, and the, and the forever kingdom, the same truth that we have opportunity to know and receive now is going to be throughout the ages to come. So it's not like, you know, we have to adopt something that's going to change later. No, what we're talking about learning kingdom life, kingdom principles, eternal, forever, important ways of living that, that we're going to be doing from now on through eternity. <clears throat> that's why it's so important that we uh, know the truth, that we study the Scripture, that we really understand what God is doing on the earth today and what His Word says about what He's doing, because these are, no doubt, eternal truths. He goes on and talks in verse 4 about walking in the truth. He says, I find some of your children, <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. If I was a pastor and uh, Jesus came in and said, well, some of you in here, some of your children are walking in the truth. Uh, you know, it would, it would be a little bit soul-searching, I think, for all of us. I mean, we would all have to, to look at ourselves and say, oh, you know, am I walking in the truth? And, and you know whether you are or not. I'm, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. But, but it's an interesting way that John approaches that when he says, some of your children... I'm very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth. The whole church hasn't turned away from the truth. There's obviously a few in this group that he's talking to that he believes has, but he says some of your children are walking in the truth just as you have received the commandment to do so from the Father. Well, we know that. You know, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So, we know that that's a big issue with God as well. And he says in verse 5 and 6, he actually gives a definition of love. If you look at it, if you can receive what he's saying there, he says, now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which you have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now look at verse 6 in light of what he said in verse 5. He says in verse 6, and this is love. Anytime you see that in Scripture where one of the authors of, of uh, one of the biblical writers says, and this is blank, whatever, he's giving us literally a definition and an insight into, sometimes it's a very simple definition. Paul does that in Ephesians chapter 3 when he's talking about the mystery, and he stops in his thought and he says, now this is the mystery. And then he explains what the mystery is. The fact that Jew and Gentile are going to be one body in the new church. You know, it's not Jew anymore and Gentile separate. It's born again believers regardless of your background. Paul says that's the mystery. That's the mystery he's talking about. So anytime you see an apostle or a biblical writer say, now this is it. 
Well, pay attention to it. Verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you, as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And then he talks about, once again, don't be deceived, stay in the truth, walk in the truth. And so that's important, so important to the early apostles. And I've often said, one of the most interesting studies I've done lately in the last couple of years is to study the last writings of all the key apostles that are in the Bible. If you look at 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Thessalonians, and 2 Peter particularly, and of course 2 and 3 John are the same way, what you're getting is, you're getting is in, in chronological lifespan of the apostles, you're getting basically the last things they said to the church before they were martyred or before they died. And I don't know about you, but if I, if I know I'm going to be leaving my family, that I'll never see them again, and I have my family around me, there's some things that I'd want to say to them that would be very important, very important to me to say them, and hopefully very important to them to receive them. And see, that's why, that's why the apostles in their last days, they saw what was coming. God even opened their eyes further to what was coming. And in almost every case in 2 uh, Timothy and 2 Peter, you'll see strong warnings about what's coming and about particularly staying in the truth and not being deceived, not falling away from the simple, powerful truth of the gospel that God gives us. And so we see that in verse 7, there's an obvious warning there against deception. No doubt about it. He says right there in verse 7, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Now, now I've said this before, but just let me remind you, most serious theological deception and false doctrine comes up out of the church. It doesn't come from heathens out on the street it, for the most part. The most damaging, the most detrimental philosophies that lead Christians astray literally come up out of the church because church leaders, whatever the case is, church people go astray and they're already in relationship with people and they know how to talk Christianese and they teach things that are off center and unbiblical and it's harder for Christians who are in relationship with them to catch it because they're already used to hearing from some of these people. Same way in the early church, several of the apostles said these, these false teachers literally went out from us. They came up through us, in us, and went out from us. And so basically that's what we have to watch for and it's exactly what's going on in the world today. Uh, the, the people that are the most influential in teaching false theology are people that, for the most part, used to be right down the center of Christianity and used to be very influential. He says they don't acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. That simply means they do not acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, can, carrying deity, being deity like God, and it, it basically, I've even taken it a little step further. I, I wrote down here, it's my opinion. It says they not only deny the deity of Jesus Christ, but they also deny the inerrant authority of God's word. You see, that's where deception starts when people who are theological Christian in nature start saying, well, you know, this was written this way, this was written this way, the original language says this, but you know, this is what, and Paul really didn't mean this, and if Paul would have known that, he wouldn't have said that. I've actually had been in meetings with ministers, not ministers I like, but uh, in community groups of ministers in the past where uh, I, I heard one young minister just out of seminary one day say, well, if Paul would have had access to the uh, genealogical and genetic uh, research that we have today, he wouldn't have written what he wrote about homosexuality. I kind of looked at the guy and thought, hmm, so Paul wasn't all that smart, huh? But that's the philosophy. That's what they say. And there's multitudes of different ways of saying that. And what they're actually saying is, they're actually saying is God's word is not trustworthy. 
God's word is not authoritative. You can't always count on God's word to be translated properly. See, that's exactly what Satan did in Genesis chapter 3. Two weeks ago when we looked at the root of the humanistic false philosophy that entered the world, it's exactly where Satan started. He says, did God really say? Did he really say? Well, it's exactly what false teachers are saying today that you can't really trust every word that's in Scripture. And so, uh, it says right here in verse, uh, in verse 8 and 9, notice what he says. He says, watch yourselves. I, that shouldn't be scary to us. If somebody tells me, to, hey, watch yourself, what that is to me, it's, it's a loving warning, warning me that I'm getting close to a cliff, and be careful, don't step off of it. So, if somebody says, watch yourself, and that's why we need to be in relationship so we can literally say those things to each other. He says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what you've accomplished. I don't want to lose 50 years of walking with Jesus Christ. I mean, goodness sakes, my whole adult life I've been walking with the Lord and growing and teaching the Word and, and studying the Word. last thing I want to do in my latter years is be an idiot. All right? I mean, I know certain areas I probably am, but I mean, in the basic things of biblical truth, I certainly don't want to go off the rails and become an idiot, you know? So I'm watching myself. I'm very cautious to watch myself, what I hear, what I listen to, what I read. And I've told you that before. I, I spend most of my limited intellectual energy in the Word of God, not in books written by people. It's the way it is for me. And so he says, watch yourself that you don't lose what you've accomplished. Obviously, he wants us to have our full reward, which is eternity in heaven. Anyone who goes too far. Now, this is interesting, the way he worded this, because what this tells me is there is some latitude. He says, he says, anyone that goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. Well, I've got a lot of pastor friends, and we argue about all kinds of stuff, you know? I mean... There's different opinions on when the rapture is going to take place. There's different opinions on, on some applications of certain life choice issues, freedom issues. I don't mind that. You know, it's not, we're not talking about going too far and you have a little bit different opinion than I do on how this is going to come about. It's talking about the basic core cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith about who Jesus is, what Jesus came to do, what he accomplished on the cross, what is the value of the blood. Uh, did Jesus bodily raise from the dead? Did Jesus ascend back to the Father? Is Jesus physically coming back to this earth to establish his kingdom? Though Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. All those things are cardinal building blocks of the Christian faith. And, and don't go too far. You know, don't compromise on that stuff. The fact that there's a real devil, there's a real hell, there's a real heaven, those are cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. And all those things right now in our world are under attack. So John says, be careful, don't go too far. It's okay to talk with people about theology and, and hang out with people that have a little different view on this, that, and the other, but make sure they're in the core of Christian theology. And he goes on there in the last verse, he says, look, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, the apostolic teaching, Paul says the same thing. Peter says the same thing. He says, follow my teaching and my example. Paul and Peter both say that in the latter part of their life. And he says, uh, and Paul even says the traditions that he kept. And so John's saying the same thing. He says, if anybody comes to you and does not bring this teaching, the solid ap application, the solid biblical teaching that the apostles gave us. Do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Folks, I'm telling you, we're living in an overly tolerant world and I see young Christians, Christians all the time who some of their Christian friends go off the rails and start teaching false doctrine and they hang out with them. They still have them over for dinner. They still spend time with them. They still run with them and do all the things they do and they end up dragging their friends with them into error. There's a time to shun false teachers. Now our culture does not like the concept of shunning, but I'm telling you right now, the Bible is strong in it. 
There's time to walk away from people who are teaching false doctrine. Not people who are confused because they're a new Christian, but people who are actually teaching false doctrine. I don't care how much you liked them as friends before. I don't care how much you love them as a family member. You don't spend time with them. He says right here, don't greet them. Don't have them into your house and don't even wish them well because they are destructive reefs in the middle of our sea. And so we need to recognize it for what it is. So what should we do? Just a little review on what I said a couple of weeks ago. Examine our own hearts. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is a powerful passage of Scripture. It tells us there, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. And then don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I can't stress that enough. We're living in a day. I'm teaching what I'm teaching these, these few weeks to prepare us to go into a study of the book of Revelation in a few weeks. But we're living in a world today where it is imperative that we search our hearts, that we renew our minds, and that we walk closely with Jesus Christ. And by all means, know what you believe. If you, if you aren't sure, if you're confused, uh, 2 Peter 1.10 says, Brother... Uh, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. That, there's your answer right there. Make certain, make, be diligent to make certain. He's talking about your understanding of the basics of salvation, the basics of who Jesus Christ, the basics of your relationship with him. And then, of course, we, we don't want to compromise with the world Ephesians talks about that. He says, don't, don't walk like Gentiles walk. You know, if all your friends are, are going, hanging out in the bar, and you know that's not a healthy place for you, don't, don't do it. You know, learn how to walk, walk holy, walk separate, walk, walk as a separate, set-aside tool, vessel for God's purpose. He says, they walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Uh, you know, don't, don't run with them. Be careful if you think you're a missionary to those kind of people and you can hang out with them in, in those dark places. Be careful. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying be careful. And then, of course, uh, you know, let our light shine bright. You know, Ephesians 2 uh, tells us, or Philipp I'm sorry, Philippians 2 tells us, prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, holding firmly to the word of life. Once again, holding firmly to the word of life so that on the day when Jesus Christ appears, we can take pride. And Paul, Paul says, I can take pride because, you know, half the church that I ministered to didn't fall away. And uh, so, amen, right? Well, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that this uh, message on truth will just be a reminder it's nothing new. We've known it for years, but uh, just a refresher of how important it is for us to hold fast to the truth that you've given us. We give you praise and we thank you for it. We thank you that the Holy Spirit gives us discernment and opens our eyes to your truth and to the snares of the enemy. We're not blind to his devices. We thank you for that today. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close in worship. And uh, if you want to talk to me about any of this, or if you want prayer, or if you're not with Jesus Christ and you want to come to Jesus Christ, you realize that you're really not connected with him uh, in the way you need to be. I want to pray with you. Okay? Let's worship him.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word and your truth. Hallelujah. Well, bless you guys. Go in peace and have a wonderful week.